I am going to uh, turn this over to him just here in a minute. I just want to say, uh, and I think everybody, most everybody was here this morning. Uh, in case you missed it, and even if you didn't miss it, that was maybe the finest message on the blood of Jesus that I've ever heard. It was really powerful, powerful, powerful. So I encourage everybody to go listen to that again and again. And if you, if you did miss it, please, please go check that out. We, did, we, did, we do have the recording available for you. Uh, everybody knows him. The man, the legend, the right reverend Christopher Alam, would you please give him a warm living word? Welcome back to this pulpit. Praise God. I don't know about the right reverend thing. If you, want to, if you were to ask my wife, she would say he's not always right. Praise God. Let's stand up together. Father, we come to your presence in the name of the Lord Jesus. We honor you, we glorify you this evening. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the price that you paid for us upon the cross. And that because of you and through you, we have life eternal. We have everything that we need. We have been healed, we have been delivered, and we have been set free because of the power of your blood shed for us. And tonight I ask you, Lord, that you would reach out and you would touch us, touch our hearts, touch our minds, touch our souls, touch us at every point in our lives, Father. Be glorified in all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Please be seated. Once again, I'm greatly honored to be here. You know, I just wanted to share this. This is, has nothing to do with my message, but... This afternoon, just before I came here, I was resting and uh, there was this something that came to me and I want to share this with you. And there may be somebody here who would benefit from it. And, you know, many of us, we go through difficulties in life that we don't. This is one thing the Lord said to me, that a lot of people you know and you talk to, uh, they're going through difficulties in life and they don't tell you. And sometimes we take people at face value, we look at them and they look okay, they look happy, but we don't know what they're actually going through. So if you're going through any situation in your life, uh, remember one thing, to always seek God. Never be despondent, never give up, but always seek the Lord. And... Uh, uh, I, I, I want to tell you, like, from my own situation in my own life, the, you know, we, we were talking yesterday about the presence of God and, uh, you know, the presence of God. Normally, and I think I said it this morning, the presence, was it, was it this morning that we talk about the presence of God and we think that's when there's nice music playing in a service and, and, you know, we get goosebumps and we go home and we think that's the presence of God. That, that's an emotional experience. But, but, but the presence of God is when you are in a very dark and despondent place and God comes and touches you and, 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 and he strengthens you in that situation. And, and in my life, I mean, I can, I can think of the times when I've had, uh, you know, encounters with Jesus, when Jesus has come and, and lifted me up and strengthened me and and, and help me in very, very difficult situation. But all those things have happened because I have, I have sought him in my difficulties. Because when difficulties come, people respond in different ways. Some people get angry and bitter. You know, that's, they say, you know, they get, they're angry at God, they're bitter at God, and, and they say, why is this happening to me? This shouldn't be happening to me. Or, I have done everything right, this shouldn't be happening to me. Now, in that situation, God will not come and touch us if we are like that. If we, if we are angry or we are bitter, God will never come and touch us. But if we seek him in our difficulty, that is when he will come and touch us. And I'm 70 years old. You know, I got saved when I was 21. I've been, I've been, I've been a believer for <laughs> 49 years. Uh, and 
I was a Muslim for 21 years, so, and I've been a Christian for 49 years, so I can say, uh, I know we have people think, oh, he knows a lot about Islam. Well, I do know about Islam, but I know more about Jesus than I know about Islam because I've been a Christian way longer, almost, you know, over two times uh, as long as I was a Muslim. And I can tell you one thing, you know, when I first got saved, the first thing they did to me was they put me in a mental hospital they, they, because they thought, uh, I was put in an army mental institute and uh, they thought that, you know, because in Islam uh, apostasy is punishable by death. If you become a Christian, they're going to kill you. That's the prescribed punishment for becoming a Christian. So, so the thing was, okay, so he has become a Christian. So why would someone choose to do something that would cause him to be under a death sentence? So, so the first thing is, he must be crazy or somebody has hypnotized him or done magic on him or, you know, all these options or he must have had a mental episode. And so they, they put me through a whole bunch of different things. That, uh, one of the things they did, they, there was this, uh, you know, I, in, in that culture, there's a lot of witchcraft. There's uh, visible manifestations of witchcraft. Now, here in America, when we talk about witchcraft, we talk about a difficult mother-in-law, you know. That's, we talk about that as witchcraft, or someone does card tricks, that's witchcraft. But there, witchcraft is witchcraft. And there was this guy, he could, uh, he was a supposedly a Muslim holy man, and he could make, make things uh, disintegrate, disintegrate, vanish. I mean, he, 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 he kind of moved around. You know, Muslims are very aware of this spirit world, that we have our natural world, the human beings, but there's, a, there's another world, it's a spirit world. Uh, in which there, there are spirits and they are organized like uh, we are organized into societies and you know how we interact with each other as human beings and so they, in the spirit world there are uh, these spirits and, and they believe there are good spirits and bad spirits but we know that even good spirits are bad spirits you know they say white magic, black magic but there's only black magic and so, uh, so this, this guy had contact but there's some people who who, who can flow and move and operate in that world. And they're, they're people who move with demons and they're the ones who can cast spells and people die and stuff like that. And so anyway, so uh, this guy, my father brought this man in uh, to <laughs> figure out what was wrong with me. And so this man, he, uh, he stayed in our house. He was in the guest room, which was next to my room. Uh, and he, he, three days, and nights he prayed. He was doing his mumbo jumbo, you know, and uh, he was praying. And then on the third day, he wanted to see me. So, you know, I was a new Christian and I didn't know what to expect. So uh, I, I met him uh, in, his, in the room. I sat down and he looked at me. He said, Young man, uh, he said, I've been up there. And uh, he says, I know this Jesus who you're following. He says, and I want you to know that you're doing the right thing. I said, really? <laughs> you know? He said, and I'll tell your father that you are doing the right thing and that God is calling, calling you and you're following Jesus. And I'll tell my dad that just leave him alone, let him go, let him follow Jesus. And, and if he's wrong, he's going to come back. But of course, my dad didn't want to hear that. But I could see this man knew those evil spirits and those demons, they knew Jesus way longer than you and I have known him. You know, so they, they, they know the truth, but, but that was it. But, you know, after that, there were other things. And I told this morning about when that, uh, another one of those people, he cursed me and he died himself. And then I was put in, a, uh, in the Army Mental Institute and there they were pumping me full of these drugs, trying to, you know, but I, I just sought the Lord during that time. And I remember uh, I got saved in, on December 13th. And when Christmas Day came, I was in the mental hospital, uh, locked up there. Just, I'd been saved like 12 days. And here I am and I thought, wow, 25th December, that's the birthday of Jesus. So I got to celebrate the birthday of Jesus. So I was actually locked up in a cage. And I managed to get hold of a cupcake. They gave me a cupcake and I had that cupcake and I thought, 
okay, this will be the birthday cake. So, so I, I prayed and I said, Jesus, I thank you that you have saved me. And today is your birthday and I'm going to celebrate your birthday. And I began to worship God. Just I didn't know any Christian songs. I was a new Christian. But just began to praise God and worship him. And suddenly the presence of God filled that cell. And the Lord said to me that you're going to be okay. This will be over. Just keep on following me. And I kept on following Jesus. And two days later, one of the staff at that mental institution, he wanted to see me. And uh, he, he, was, he was a sergeant. I was an officer, so he was very respectful. He said, sir, can I talk to you? I said, sure. So he took me outside to the garden. He said, sir, there's nothing wrong with you. We don't know why they put you here. So I told him it's because I've given my life to Jesus. And he says, I've been watching you. He said, I also want your Jesus. And he began to cry. So I prayed with him and he received Jesus. And the next day he told the, the psychiatrist uh, and told him that I have also received Jesus. And uh, the psychiatrist, he didn't know what to do with me. So he released me from there. So, uh, you know, you see, God's presence and, and blessings, they don't follow your trouble but they follow your commitment. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of people go through troubles, but God doesn't follow your troubles. He follows your commitment when you, when you see those things. And, and through, through my life, I've been through those situations again and again. Then there was another time I was teaching in a Bible college in Sweden, and I was, uh, I was really seeking God really seeking God's presence and, and uh, because I, I wanted to see, I wanted God to see, uh, I wanted God to do more miracles because I be, had began to travel overseas and preach the gospel. I was seeking him and then one day I, I was at a seminar. We had a, a guest speaker from the United States, a lady preacher. She, she's not known these days but in the 80s, she was quite well known. So she used to come to Sweden and she was preaching. And then after the service, we went to somebody's home for some coffee and tea. And we were there and we, we, we ended up sitting on the floor in the pastor's living room. We were sitting on the floor and we were talking about the things of God. And she walked up to me and she laid hands on me. And when she laid hands on me, immediately I left my body. It, it was not something I wanted or asked for, but I just left my body and I could see myself there. And I went up and I went and then I was like flying through space. And then I saw this beautiful city and the gates open and I went into heaven and I saw Jesus. And God began to deal with me. And anyway, so after I came back, I don't want to go into all the details, but there was a change in my life. And there, there, was a, there was a change. So that experience was so holy. I never, this is the first time in a public place I'm talking about it. I've never talked about it except privately with some uh, people. So please don't make a big deal out of it. But this, it was so holy for me. I never talked about it. And, uh, and then what happened was that uh, um, People began to notice that there was a change in me. I was teaching at a Bible college, and my students began to say, something has happened to you, Pastor. What is it? Anyway, so after that, I mean, my ministry exploded. I began to see miracles. I had my crusades got bigger and all that. But what happened was, you know, I was flying on the wings of success. I had miracles. I had huge crusades. Everything went well. And about, I should say, 13 years later, I was, I was in Burma. And I was in a meeting and really seeking God. And so I was laying prostrate on the floor in the service. We were all worshiping God. And we sensed the presence of God. And I was on my face on the floor seeking God. And when suddenly I saw an open vision. And when I saw, I saw an open vision, uh, it was... And I, I was on the floor, I was awake, I was wide awake, but I was totally oblivious to what was around me. I saw an open vision, it was like a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, there was a beautiful picture, and the Lord said, this is your life. And then I saw a hand come and begin to turn the pieces of the puzzle upside down, and uh, 
So it became a new puzzle, you know, like a new picture. And that picture was ugly. And the Lord said, this is the real you. And I said, Lord, but, you know, you, I went to heaven and I saw Jesus and I have been doing ministry. And the Lord said, what has happened is that success in ministry has taken you away from me. You're too busy preaching, too busy ministering. You're, you know, you, you, you are rejoicing in, in, in your success in ministry, and, but you don't worship me like you used to. You don't spend time in my presence as you used to. And I felt terrible. I suddenly realized, and then I suddenly realized what, uh, I heard a voice that says that, uh, you know, from the book of Revelations, and the Lord said, you have done this, 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 and all this is good. But one thing I have against you, you have lost your first love. And then it says, so consider from what a height you have fallen. And, and I suddenly realized that when we lose our first love, that's a great fall in the eyes of God. We think falling into sin is a great fall. Falling into sin is a small thing. Because if you fall into sin, you can repent, make things right, and say, and make things right. But when you lose your first love, that's a big fall. And I realized how big I had fallen, how deep I had fallen. And I, I realized, I, you know, I thought, God has given me so much. He has invested so much in my life, but I have failed him. And at that moment, it felt like if the Lord would totally discard me and reject me, he would be totally justified in doing so. And yet at the same time that he would love me so much that he would even, he would even, he would even take the time to point my failure out to me. That he would even bother to point my failure out to me. That, that really got me that he still loves me. And then God began to deal with other things in my life. But then you know what I'm saying is that sometimes the presence of God, when, when God touches us, it's not always pleasant things. It can be difficult things. It can be times of repentance and brokenness and weeping when God, you know, puts his finger on things in our lives. But that is, that is the love of God. The love of God isn't always gooey, gooey and fuzzy and warm. Sometimes the love of God is to point out our flaws and, 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 you know, and the Bible says that he chastises those he loves. Thank God that for that conviction that can come and hit us at times and make us feel miserable. Thank God that the Holy Spirit is still dealing with us because that is the love of God. The worst place for us to be is when we are doing our thing and we never feel any conviction. We are wrong, but we never feel any conviction. That's the worst place to be in. So what I'm saying is that all through my life, as I said, I'm 70 years old. I've been in the ministry for 40 years. I, you know, you, you, you realize that life, life has its, you know, it goes in waves. It has its ups and downs. There are times of great victories, but there's also times of great difficulties. There are times of despondency. There's times you feel rejected. There are times... You feel lonely. You go through difficult times. But in all those things, God always touches us. There are times we fail and we miss the, we, you know, we drop the ball, we miss the mark. But God always touches us if there's one thing we maintain in our lives constantly, that we keep our hearts pure and we always seek him. If we always seek his face, and we always stay at a place where we are dependent upon him. Because if we are not dependent upon him, if we are self-sufficient, that's when we don't seek his face. So if we always stay at a place where we are seeking the face of God and, you know, we need him, we are dependent upon him, then you know what? No matter whatever situation we are in, whether we are in a valley or we are on a mountaintop, God will always come through and he will always meet us, he will always touch us. You know, as a word of faith preacher, we don't like to hear about valleys and difficult things. Isn't that true, Pastor Scott? When we were young, everything was victory, you know. You always had a good confession. But I tell you what, I've been through tough times. 
And one of the worst thing we did, we learned not to talk about the difficulties we went through because that was a bad confession. And that's sometimes the worst thing you can do. Look for someone to stand with. I had a very dear friend. His wife was like a little sister to me. She used to pray for me. I mean, he was my friend, but I was very close to her also, and she would pray for me. She was a brother Christian. She was a prayer warrior, so she had me on the prayer list. And one day I see on Facebook, she died. She passed away. I couldn't believe it. I checked and I found she had passed away. So I visited my friend. He was in another city. And I was mad at him. I said, what happened? You never told me. I'm your friend. He said, well, you know, she was fighting cancer, but she didn't want to tell anyone because, you know, because, you know, it's, it's the whole faith thing. You're standing in faith, and so if you tell somebody you're going through a hard time, you're not in faith. I was mad. I said, I'm mad at you. I said, she was your wife, but for me, she was my sister. She used to pray for me. The least you could have done is to tell me, and we, we would have stood with you and prayed for her. But I said, but okay, we rejoice she's in heaven, but that's not the way to do it. We realize the reality of life is we are human beings, we are in Christ, but live in a, we have, I always say this to people, I said, you know, we have these existentialist questions, you know, why don't people get healed, and why do people, why does this happen, that happen, people ask me all these questions, and I always say this, we have a perfect God, we have a perfect Savior, we have a perfect word, but we are imperfect people living in a fallen world, so there's always things that go around things that happen that shouldn't happen and we don't always understand. But the, we the best thing we can do is no matter what you do is hold, you know, hold on to Jesus. Hold on. To, you know that old song, it says, I will cling to that old rugged cross. That was one of the first songs I learned. So when I was in prison, I used to sing. I said, you know, and those words, I will cling to that old rugged cross. I'm in prison. I was in mental hospital. They're persecuting me. They want to kill me. My own father, he wanted to kill me. I said, but you know what? I'm going to just cling to that cross. I don't know everything. I don't understand everything. I'm not a deeply spiritual person, but I am going to cling to that cross. Hallelujah. Because that cross is our only hope and it will carry us through. Jesus will always just hold on to the cross. And then the second thing, hold on to your friends. Because my friends have saved my life more than once. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God that I have friends who pray for me. I mean, I go through things. I, I call my friends. I said, hey, I'm going to Africa. I'm going to a bad place. Please pray for me. I'm not afraid to ask them. Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Have I ever been sick? Yeah, I've been sick. But when I get sick... I speak the word of God, then I call my friends, hey, I'm going through this, please pray for me. Thank God for friends like that. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't know why I said this, who this applies to, but I just had this in my heart to share this with you. So walk with Jesus and never get to that point of despondency when you think everything is hopeless. Nothing is hopeless. There's always hope. You know, a few weeks ago, I was in Paris, France, and I was telling uh, telling pastor there was this uh, uh, there was this creature who <laughs> who came up I, I saw I saw this person at the end I said person at the end because I couldn't make out whether it was a man or a woman and uh, sitting in the back of the crowd and it came up and it was a man when he came up close it was a man wearing makeup and lipstick and wear women's clothes Women wearing, you know, and I mean, some, some men, they're very soft features, you know. So when they dress like women, it's hard to tell. This guy was ugly, you know. I'm sorry, but he was, you know. I mean, he, I was like, I was like dear Lord, you know. So this guy comes wearing women's clothes and makeup, and he tells me, this is what he tells me. And he says, and he was in his 40s. And he says, my father is a pastor. I come from a, my parents are godly people. But when I was 18 years old, I rejected them. 
I rejected their God and I became a woman and I've li lived like a woman all these years and I'm miserable and I'm unhappy and I want to come back to Jesus. Can you pray with me? And that's why I thought, you know what? No one is beyond hope. Hallelujah. Even a guy in his position comes to church. People like that don't come to church. But the fact that he came to church and then he came up because somewhere in the darkness he reached out and took a hold of Jesus. Never let go. Amen. And never let go of your kids. You know, kids, your kids, you know, never let go. Never let go of your kids. Never let go of Jesus. There is always hope. Hallelujah. I believe that. Because God is faithful. But he can move only when we decide never to let go of him. If we, if we, if we throw everything to the winds and we get mad, you know, that, that's when we can't really expect anything. But if you hold on to him, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen? Praise God. Well, I just wanted to share this. This was, you know, this was not my message, as I said. But I took, oh my goodness, I've spoken for 30 minutes already. But you don't mind sticking around for some time, do you? Are you okay? Now, I want to show you some pictures. Some, can I show this picture? Some, uh, these are our recent crusades in Africa. You know, we are always doing crusades in Africa. These are the recent ones. And let's see. Some of them, this is, next slide, this is in, uh, in Tanzania. In Tanzania, the, we normally do our crusades in the evening, but Tanzania has a law that you have to finish everything by 6 o'clock. So uh, they don't allow night meetings. So this was um, in Tanzania. And the next picture, uh, this was in Zambia, in Chawama. This was, you know, uh, Zambia, I mean, it was amazing. We went to this place and... They were shut down because of COVID and the whole country was shut down. And this was the first thing that they allowed, open air crusade that they allowed after the pandemic was over. So, and uh, the next picture is, uh, this is also in Zambia, another place in Zambia. And the next one, uh, this was also in another place in Zambia. We did many crusades in Zambia and Mozambique. No, I'm sorry. This was in Mozambique. This was in a town which was right in the center of the country. And but nobody had preached there for, I mean, forever because they had a guerrilla insurgency going on for like, I think, 45 eight years or something, the government had been fighting the guerrillas and this was the headquarters of the guerrillas. So there was, there was, you know, nobody had ever preached there. So we went there and then what had happened, we found out that the deputy governor of this region, he was Pentecostal and the government had sent him there. So they had a ceasefire with the guerrilla. So the government began to establish control over the area. So he went there, he was strong Pentecostal. The first thing he did, he saw how corrupt the government officials were. He fired everybody. And he, he hired only Pentecostal. He said, unless you're born again speaking in tongues, you can't get a job here. So all the police, everybody, and so, all the corruption was gone. No bribery, no corruption. Everybody, the cops, everybody was Pentecostal. And he told me, he said, Pastor, this week that you are here holding the crusade, the government, uh, sorry, the guerrillas are laying down their arms and they have, we have, finally we have peace in the country. So we were there. And this place, if you go to Google Earth, you see it's just a collection of huts. And it was very hard to go there. There was a road there. There is a road. And the and the potholes were like swimming pools. You couldn't believe it. Our 18-wheeler truck would kind of disappear into the pothole, then would come out the other side, and it was horrible. So that's where, it is. now for me to get there, I had to get, and there was no airport there. We had to land on a grassy field 
uh, on this one of those safari aircraft, on this little airplane. So I flew in on that little airplane, but before the plane landed, when they saw the plane coming, a guy went out on a motorbike and chased away all the antelopes and monkeys and baboons from the field so that the plane could land. It, it was interesting, you know. But, but God moved and we had a wonderful crusade. Thousands of people saved and there were people, people walked from 20, 30 miles away. They came walking to hear the gospel and there were people who had churches, you know, they had churches out in the bush, small churches and many of the pastors didn't have Bibles. So I said to them, I said, is there anything you can do for me? Uh, anything I can do for you guys? And they said, we need Bibles for the pastors. So I said, how many pastors are there? They said, in the entire region, I think there were about 200 pastors, 260 pastors. So I said, okay, I'll get you Bibles. So uh, we found out the cost of Bibles. It was like $10 each. It was $2,600, um, which, was, which isn't really much, from, you know, from our money. So I called a pastor friend of mine, and he, had, he used to say, you need anything, call me. I said, hey, I need, I need money for Bibles for these pastors. So he cut out a check and sent me, and so we now get Bibles to, uh, you know, put them in their hands. So this was fantastic, and we'll be going back to that area. The entire region, now that the guerrillas are gone, we can preach the gospel there. So anyway, the next picture is, uh, this was also in Zambia, in a place called Linda, in Zambia. And the next one, uh, this, is, you know, this is called Chipata Compound. Uh, and the next one, this was again in, in Zambia. Now, these are all our latest crusades. And the next one is, this was again in Mozambique, out in the bush. And the next one is, now this is, these are, uh, this is the graduation of our church planting school in Africa. In the morning, I showed you our church planting school in Asia, the one in Africa. We graduated 53 church planters. And the next one. Uh, this was a woman who she was carried like she was like a vegetable and they carried her and she was unable to walk or to see or to speak Jesus healed her totally now this was this was in a town which was the uh, headquarters of witchcraft in Zambia and so when I came there they told me about this powerful witch doctor he had killed a lot of people by putting a witchcraft spell on them and they died and the police knew what this man was doing, but how can you prove, uh, you know, murder by witchcraft? And so pastors were scared of this guy. I, I didn't know who he was. They just told me the first day. The police were scared of him. The pastors were frightened of him. But he just used to put a spell and people died. So uh, he came to our crusade. So I didn't know that. So because, you know, there were all these people. So uh, three times he tried to get on the platform to share testimony and they wouldn't let him on. So the fourth time he managed to get up, and I didn't, still didn't know who he was, and he said something in their language. So everybody laughed. He got a laugh out of people. And then as he was leaving, I didn't know who he was, I turned to him. I said, it's a dangerous thing to mock the Spirit of God. I still had no idea who he was. He went home, and as soon as he reached home, he dropped dead. I tell you, the fear of God hit that town. And people began to come and get saved. And that in that whole situation, this girl, she was 15 years old, she was carried, she was like a vegetable. She couldn't walk, couldn't see, couldn't speak, and God healed her completely. She was up, walking, running, completely delivered. And the next one is this woman was paralyzed. She's now walking and running. And the next one is uh, this woman was completely blind. So I asked her to touch my nose if she could see my face. So she was... That's what this picture was. And the next one is, uh, this was the local traditional chief. And in Africa, it's the local tradition chiefs, they are the ones who have the power and the influence. So he, um, he, was, he couldn't walk and he was deaf in one ear. He got healed. And the next one is this. Now, this is, this is very funny testimony. <laughs> this guy, he was in a motor accident in the morning. And it was a bad, I don't know what happened, but the, the whole, like his ear and this whole part of his face were torn off. I mean, his, you know, it, it just came off. 
and he was bleeding and you could see, if you look at his shirt on the left side, it's covered with dried blood. So they rushed him to the ER and the doctor took one look at him and took that ear and that part, put it back and put a bandage over him and said to his friends, take him to the crusade and get him prayed for. And so <laughs> they brought him that evening and God healed him. Uh, his, his whole thing fused back and he says, my, everything is back, I, have, I can feel everything and I have my hearing, I'm perfectly okay. I wish I could shake the doctor's hand, it's good for doctors like that, you know. So doctor just said, go to the crusade, you, you're going to be okay. So then the next, I think this is the last picture, anyway. Praise God, praise God. Now I want to share with you, uh, I'll share with you something very brief from the word of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And here's the words of the Apostle Paul. In verse 14 he says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the Gentiles, both to the wise and the unwise. That is why I'm ready to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So Paul begins to say, I'm a person who is in debt. I'm a debtor. I'm in debt. And he says, I'm basically what he's saying, I'm in debt to everybody. I'm debt, in debt to the Greeks. I'm, debt, I'm in debt to the Gentiles. And I'm a man who's in debt. And, you know, I really thought of it. And I thought, oh, I'm free in Christ. But the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul he didn't say I'm free. Because we talk about how Jesus paid our debt and the debt for our sins he paid to God. But we are still in debt. So I began to, I sat down and I took a piece of paper and I thought, I'm going to make a list of those who I am in debt to. And so I began to make my list. And the first person on my list was a man called Jesus of Nazareth. I'm in debt to him because when I was a sinner, he loved me. When I didn't even believe in myself, he believed in me. And he chose to invest in me. And he saved me. And he decided to call me his own. Even when my own family wouldn't have anything to do with me. So because of that, I'll forever be in his debt. And if there's anything good in my life today, it is because of him. Really, because there was nothing good in me. When I came to Jesus, I was suicidal, I was hopeless, there was nothing good in me. So if there is anything good in me today, it is because of him. So I'm in debt to him. So he is number one on my list of people who I am indebted to. The second person on my list is a man called Keith Frampton. And let me tell you who Keith Frampton was. Keith Frampton was the, uh, the son of Mr. and Mrs. K.P. and Pauline Frampton, who in the 60s and the 70s were the wealthiest Christians in Great Britain. They were great philanthropists. They were, they were the biggest givers to Christian uh, missions work. And they had three sons, Keith, Clive, and David. And one day, Keith... And David said to their parents, uh, Mom and Dad, God has called us to the missions field. David went to the Middle East. Clive stayed, the oldest son. He stayed with his parents, helped his parents with their business. And David, who I'm still in touch with, David, he went to the Middle East. He learned Arabic and preached the gospel in the Middle East for many, many years. Keith got on a bus he traveled on that bus all the way across Europe, the Middle East, Asia. And he came to the city of Lahore in Pakistan. 
And his friends told me that he was just there for one day. He was in transit. He was going to India. So his friends said that he was... Uh, that night he arrived, he was tired, but that night they could hear him pray. In, in, in the room they gave him, they could hear him pray loudly and he was pleading with God for one soul. Father, give me one soul, one man who will rise up and serve you. Just one person. And then the next morning he woke up and did the unthinkable in a Muslim country. He went on the street and began to hand out tracts. He was believing God for one soul. And I came walking down the road, on the other side of the road, and I remember looking at this tall Englishman. He was about six foot six. He was a very tall, skinny guy. And I remember, remember looking at his face and thinking that this guy has a peace and a joy that I have never known. And I thought, you know, in the 70s, everyone was using drugs. I thought, I've got to find out what he has been smoking. And I went and began to ask him who he was and Keith began to tell me about Jesus and that was the day I got saved. So I'm here because Keith Frampton shared the gospel with me. He died of COVID, unfortunately, I think two years ago, his brother told me. But I will always be in his debt. Then the third person on my list would be Pastor Jim Turner. And last time I was here, I told you about him. He was the one who baptized me. And the Muslims killed him because he baptized me. Pastor Jim Turner. Then there have been other people who have invested in my life who I'm in debt to. One man was Kenneth e. Hagen. His teachings completely changed my life. So, I first heard of him 44 years ago. But 44 years later today, my family and I, the way we live our lives, how we believe God, my ministry, how I live, how I preach, everything has been based on what I learned from that man. So I, I owe him a debt. And they've been... Other people also, like him, they have been men of God who have been father figures in my life. My pastor, Pastor Sam Smucker, back home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, he invested in my life. He brought us to the United States. The worship center of my home church sponsored us, so we moved to the U.S. All that. Then there have been people, people like uh, you have never heard of. A lady called Dottie Sheeler, she went home to be with the Lord three, four years ago. Since the day she met us, she prayed for us for about 30 years. She prayed for us every single day. Can you imagine that? And she, her name is not known on this earth, but for me, as far as I'm concerned, her name is known in heaven. So, I am what I am because of all these people who have invested in my life. People who have believed in me. And I'll never forget one day, uh, a few years ago, we, we used to get and, you know, uh, people send money to our ministry. So there was always this envelope that came uh, every month. Once a month we got this envelope and there was a dollar bill in it. And a little note with a childish scribble that uh, we are praying for you, we believe in you. Thank you for what you're doing. And I read that note. There's always that note. It was signed by somebody called Penny. So I said to my wife, I wonder who this is, because it was always postmarked Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I live. I wonder who this is. And my wife said, let me check. I'll find out who this Penny is. Because for several years, we were receiving this dollar every month. So one day, we were outside a strip mall, and there was a, a, do you have the Marshalls stores here? Marshalls, where they sell clothes, cheap, you know. So we were parked outside the Marshalls. I don't know what, why we were parked there. And then we saw this young woman about in her 20s. She was, uh, she was uh, you know, she was, how do you say it? She was physically handicapped. 
and she had cerebral palsy, the way she was walking with great difficulty, and she was wearing an employee's badge because marshals actually hire disabled people. And she was walking with great difficulties, you know, her body was bent over, and my wife said, there, there she is, that's Penny. She's in our church, that's Penny. And I suddenly realized, you know, a dollar is a dollar. But then suddenly the value of the dollar went up because I saw the amount of love and faith that was behind the dollar bill. I, I, I began to cry and I said to my wife, you know, these people, they believe in us, that they trust us. We have to be very careful how we spend God's money. There's a lot of faith and a lot of love that goes beyond, behind these things. So, and I think of her, I added her to my list. These are the people who I'm indebted to. Are you with me? So these are, and so if you look at your own life, you will have your own list. People who have prayed for you, people who have invested in you, people who have believed in you. Some of you grew up in a Christian home, but you were backslidden, but you were back with Jesus, but you are back with Jesus because there are faithful people who prayed for you. Maybe not famous people, but they prayed you back in. Like that transgender guy, you know, I'm in France. I mean, somebody prayed him back. He must have had parents who prayed him back. Somebody, those are the people you're in debt to. So Paul said, I'm in debt. He said, that is why I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. That is why I am ready to preach the gospel always because my life is not my own. I'm bound to a lot of other people who, are, who have invested in my life, who are banking on me, who are, you know, they've invested on me, but they're depending on me and they're believing God. They believe in the calling on the anointing that is on my life and they're praying for me because they know that God has called me to go to places where they would want to go to, but they are not called to go, to go but they are sending me. So, you know, you are part of a chain of something far bigger than you can envision. Sometimes you can feel lonely. You can feel, you know, here's my life. But listen, you are tied to a lot of other people. You're part of a chain that is bigger than you. And so I realized that. And that's why I, I am always ready to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. No matter where I go, no matter where I am, I'm ready because I want to serve Jesus. Amen. And then he says here, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, many people today are ashamed of the gospel. And the reason they're ashamed of the gospel is that they have a gospel that does nothing for anybody. But we are not ashamed because we know what the gospel is and how powerful the gospel is. The gospel is powerful. When we preach the gospel, stuff happens. I'll never forget, uh, I, you know, 19, uh, I don't know, I think about 20 years ago, 19 years ago, there was a big earthquake in, in Pakistan and about, I think, 350,000 people were killed or something like that. It was very bad. So the Lord told me to collect money to send them. So I collected money. And the Lord told me to send it through the Retired Officers Alumni Association. So now, this is very interesting because, you know, I was one of those 
uh, officers, you know, we were all part of this military college. Some went to the Air Force, some went to the Army. I went into the Army. And then, you know, when the Internet first came, and there were Internet forums and all that, before Facebook and all that. So one of my old military buddies, he found me. He lives in Tulsa. He found me. And he, because somebody, some converted Muslim was witnessing to him and mentioned my name. And he said, oh, I know him. He was my classmate. So anyway, he contacted me and he told me about, he said, you know, all our old friends are in this, this uh, retired, uh, you know, this officers alumni forum. So I joined in. So I joined in there. And then, uh, anyway, so what happened, that I, and I was, you know, participating in that. But what I didn't know was that some of them were not very happy because they said, this guy's a traitor. And, you know, he left Islam, became a Christian, became an infidel. And why is he with us? So one of these guys who was my best friend was always defending me. He called me. He said, you know, some of these guys are talking ugly about you. But I've been telling them. I said that he has not done anything wrong. Okay, he became a Christian, but that's his personal matter. He served together with us. He went to war alongside us. He's one of us, and he has every right to be with us. So when they would meet, you know, some people were really critical of me. So I didn't know this. I found this out later on. But what happened, the Lord told me, uh, that because they to, they made an appeal for a fund to uh, you know to help these earthquake victims and the Lord sent told me give the money to them so I sent them a check and so when the list of they published a list of donors and my name was on top of the list I was the biggest donor and so in the next meeting my friend stood up he says. This is the same guy who you said has become an infidel and you're criticizing him and saying, why is he with us? He doesn't belong. He's not one of us anymore. And he says, he's giving more to help our people than all our Muslim brothers. You should be ashamed of ourselves. So they said, when they found out I was going to Pakistan, they said, please come and see us. So I went to, to see you know, the earthquake relief Work. So when I went there, you know, they gave me VIP treatment. They, uh, at the airport, they, the, when the plane landed, um, they opened the door and this army major came in and they were, the whole entourage came in and they took me out. I was the first one to leave the plane. I didn't have to go to immigration. Cause, I mean, they gave me, they rolled out the red carpet for me. They had a dinner for me. They treated me very well. So now suddenly I'm a good guy. And so one day I'm sitting there in my hotel room with this guy. He, he's a retired colonel from the Air Force. And he said, he said, buddy, tell me, what is it that you actually do? I said, let me show you. So I pulled out a little DVD I have with, you know, presentation on the ministry. And I was showing that. Then he said, stop, stop, stop. Then he said, this little boy, you said he was born lame. And he got up. And begin to walk because God healed him. I said, that's correct. He says, but God healed him because you prayed for him? I said, yeah. He says, but we were together. You were just like us. We did all those bad stuff together. We used to sit in the office, officers mess drinking and all that. I mean, I know you. How come God hears your prayers? I mean, what have you become? I said, I'm glad you asked. I began to tell him about Jesus. I said, it's not because of me. It's because of Jesus. See, every time I pray, I pray in the name of Jesus. I don't come to God in my own name. If I came to God in my own name, Nothing would happen, but I come to God in the name of Jesus. If I am anything, it's because of Jesus. And I pray in his name, and I said, you know what? You can do the same. You can come to Jesus. You can give your life to Jesus like I gave my life to Jesus. And you can approach God in the name of Jesus, and God will hear your prayers. That is why I'm ready to preach the gospel because I'm not ashamed of the gospel because we have a gospel that actually does something. Hallelujah. We have a message that actually affects people's lives. That's why he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation 
to everyone who believes. Now, I want to tell you, let's look at Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, I believe it's Acts 14. Okay, this is when the apostles were persecuted. And then it says here, Okay, so they came to a city called Lystra, okay, as they were escaping from the Jews who were persecuting them. It says in verse number eight, in Lystra they set a man, they sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and he had never walked. He said he listened to Paul as he was speaking, okay. Now, verse 7, it says that they came to Lystra and there they preached the gospel. Okay, so what was Paul preaching? The gospel. So as he's preaching the gospel in Lystra, they set a man in his audience who was crippled in his feet. He had never walked since birth. And he says, this is what happened. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. And then Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. And called out, stand up on your feet. At that moment, at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Now, so Paul goes to Lystra. And he goes there. And what does he do there? He preaches the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? Do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is the simplest thing. The gospel is the story of Jesus it's the story of his virgin birth, his sinless life, his death upon the cross, his resurrection from the dead. That is the gospel. That's all it is. It is the story of Jesus, of his virgin birth, his sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension to heaven. That is the gospel. That story, it's a story but this gospel is foolishness to the world. Why? Because every component of the story, it doesn't make sense to man. The virgin birth, can you imagine? A man who is born of a virgin. That's the first foolishness. Secondly, that he, when he lived on this earth, he lived a sinless life. How can a man live a sinless life? Then he died. Now that's the only part that is credible. He died. But then he rose from the dead. Right? Then the next part, he ascended to heaven. And he's at the right hand of God. That's the gospel. That story is the gospel and it's foolishness to man. But the wisdom of God is greater. The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of man. Man might hear the gospel and say, this is foolishness. But when we preach that gospel, that gospel is powerful. That's when God shows up. So now, Paul is preaching the gospel, and while he's preaching, here's this man, lame from birth, sitting there. Now, I want you to understand, they lived in a, that society was very fatalistic. Fatalism is when a man believes that everything, every condition is because of the will of God. Islam is a fatalistic religion. I was told Everything that happens, good or bad, is the will of God. When bad things happen, you don't understand, but something good will come out of it. It's the will of God anyway. So if someone is born crippled, well, that's God's will. It's fate. That's why it's called fatalism. It's fate. So he grew up in a fatalistic society. So all his life he had been told, he had all these questions, you and I, why was I born crippled? And he was told, it's the will of God. But why was it the will of God? Listen, don't ask us some, such questions. Just accept it. Don't torture yourself by asking why I was born that way. It is the way it is. There will always be something good that comes out of it. It's the will of God. So that's the way he had grown up. He had been told, this is the way it is, and it will never change. And here comes a man who begins to talk about somebody 
who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, who died on the cross for him and bore his sins and his diseases upon the cross. And as he tells this story, something happens to that man. So from a lifelong story of despondency, he suddenly, something happens to him, faith rises in his heart. But that faith that rose in his heart was so strong, that faith which is a condition of the heart, but in his case it was so strong that Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. Very rarely do you see faith on a person's face, but Paul saw it that day. And he pointed his finger at the man and said, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked and he was healed. And there was an uproar in the town. Everybody was, you know, just they had never seen anything like it before. That's the power of the gospel. Hallelujah. So I remember when I read this story, I used to say, I, really, this is true. I said, Lord, I wonder what Paul preached. I wish, I, I wish they had, you know, um, cassette tape players those days that, you know, we, we could know. I said, if I knew what Paul preached, man, that's the only message I would preach because everywhere I would go and preach, people who are hopeless would have hope and they would, the lame would rise up and walk. And the Lord says, but it's right there. And I saw, where is it? And then I saw verse 7. And there they preached the gospel. The gospel was the message that Paul preached. When we tell people the story of Jesus and what he did for them upon the cross, something always happens. You know what happens? The Holy Spirit happens. Because the Holy Spirit comes in when we preach the gospel. And so... He rose up and walked. So that is the power of the gospel. That's why Paul said, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Now, if you go to Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthians. Remember when he says, when I came to you, I would not that you wouldn't know anything, anybody else except Jesus, Christ and him as crucified. He said, I didn't come to you declaring man's wisdom. You, you know why he wrote that? Paul, when he first came to the European continent, he preached the gospel in Athens, Greece. Athens was the center of philosophy. And we... Marcel, if you've been to Athens, Greece, you got the Parthenon up on the, on the hill and down from the Parthenon, you got this place called Mars Hill. And nobody knows it is there because... But because there's a bronze plaque that has never been polished, never been cleaned, you know, in today's secular society, no one, everyone sees the Parthenon, nobody's interested in place in the place where Paul preached. So I looked for it. I asked the tourist guide. They didn't know what it was. And I looked, 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 and then I suddenly saw this plaque. This is Mars Hill, where Paul first preached the gospel. So when he came to Mars Hill, and there, from when you stand on Mars Hill, it's actually not a hill, it's a big rock. You stand on that rock and you look and you see the place where uh, they told me, that's the place where Paul sat and he debated with the philosophers. And he, you know, that, that's the place where all the philosophers used to sit. Now, Paul was not a dummy. Paul was smart. He was theologically well-schooled, but he was also very smart. He was very educated in philosophy, he could match wits with the best of them. So when he came to Athens, he decided to present the gospel to them in the context of philosophy. Because that's what they understood. You know, they were philosophers. They were big into philosophy. They respected philosophy. So he came with the philosophy of Christ. He came and he had no success in Athens. That's why Athens, although it was the biggest city, there is no letter in the New Testament to the church in Athens because Paul totally failed to do anything there. That's why there was no letter to the church in Athens because there was no church in Athens. Although Athens was the biggest city in the region, that was the whole center, that was the capital city. From there he went to Corinth. And when he came to Corinth, he said to himself, I'm not going to do, repeat the same mistake that I 
did in Corinth. I'm not going to engage them in Greek philosophy, but I'm going to preach Christ crucified. So he came to Athens, he preached Christ crucified. And that's why there was a big church in Athens, so that the two of the biggest letters in the New Testament, he wrote to the church in Athens. Uh, Corinth, I'm sorry, to the, I'm sorry, you're right, to the church in Corinth. And that's where, that's why he wrote to them. He reminded them, he said, remember brothers, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I preach Christ crucified. All If you read the first and the second chapter, you'll see he talked about preaching Christ crucified. And that is the gospel. And that is what everybody can share. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can say, I've never studied theology. I have never been to Bible college. But you can tell the story of Jesus crucified. You can tell them. How, you know, I tell them. I tell them in like I did today. I tell them in bloody, gory detail. Because I know the gorier, the bloodier it gets, the bigger the miracles are. I tell them how Jesus was whipped and bruised and beaten, bearing their sicknesses, carrying their diseases, carrying their pains upon himself. I tell them how he was crowned with thorns and how he was nailed to that cross, how he hung upon the cross, bearing their sins. And when I do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and brings conviction, and that's when people get saved. Let me finish with a little story. Years ago, uh, I went to India to an area that was very, very difficult. There was a lot of persecution. Actually, what happened, there was a friend of mine, an Indian friend. He went and preached in the gospel, the gospel in this area. There were very few Christians there. And uh, the Hindu fundamentalists turned against him. And uh, they went on a rampage and they burnt, I think they burnt about 20, Christ, uh, 20 churches, small churches. But they burnt about 20 churches and they killed some Christians, some pastors. It was very bad. So the government had, had uh, forbidden all gospel uh, or any kind of religious gathering in that place. So I read, you know, it was so bad, I read about it in the International Herald Tribune newspaper in Sweden. So... I said, well, that's the area where, you know, that's the same state where I have been preaching. So I called my guy in India. I said, I'm coming. I want to do a crusade there. He said, we can't do a crusade there because we had never been there. That was quite far away, but it was in the same state. I said, let's go and do a crusade. Anyway, cut a long story short, I went with my team and we set up a crusade in this place. And the first night, Second night, the third night. So what had happened, I, I really fasted and prayed and prepared. So I was fasting and praying. And the third day, I had a red hot message ready to preach. And I got up and I began to preach. And there were thousands of people that were gathered. And while I was preaching, uh, about 20 minutes into the message, the Lord said to me, stop preaching and start praying for the sick. And I said, Lord, I got to preach. I've got pre prepared a message. And the Lord said, no, you begin to pray. So I began to pray. And uh, I, I prayed for, I always pray for the deaf first. And suddenly deaf people began to hear. And then I prayed for the blind. And there were blind people received. So I just prayed over the crowd. Then I said, I'm going to pray for the paralyzed. And suddenly there were shouts in the back. And people were shouting. There was a lot of commotion in the back. And soon I saw... There was a man walking through the crowd, walking to the front. He had his hands up in the air and he was shouting in their language. He was saying, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. So I was saying, what happened? What's happening? But, you know, they were all shouting and they couldn't hear me. So anyway, so this man was coming through the crowd and the crowd was letting him through. As he came to the front, closer to the front, my interpreter saw him and got frightened. And this guy jumped on the platform, grabbed the microphone from the interpreter, and he shouted, Jesus is alive! 
The moment he said that, the place came unglued. There were people who were, had been sitting up on trees, you know, to hear, because the field was full. They began to jump down from the trees. Other people were climbing up on the trees so they could get a better view. I mean, they was chaotic. And then this guy, he jumps off the platform and he kind of begins to walk in this direction. He had come from this direction and he had his hands in the air. He was just shouting one thing, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive. And thousands of people began to follow him. And the whole crowd followed him and there were trees outside the field. They followed him through the trees and in 10 minutes the field was empty. Everyone had followed this man. And I had a team from Sweden, they were with me and the pastors and I didn't know what had happened. Why had everybody left? With this man, I couldn't even do my altar call. So then the main pastor, he came and he was white as a sheet. I said, who was this man? And they told me that he, this man was born paralyzed. He, he couldn't stand without crutches. You know the big crutches they have under the armpits. He said all his life he could, he could only stand with those crutches. And he was the leader of the Hindu extremists who were killing Christians and burning churches. So he says, when he heard that there was a crusade coming, he came with two truckloads of his people. He says, I knew him. Everybody here knows him. And I saw him. He was in the back while you were preaching. He came. So I went to the back and some of his people were standing there with hand grenades in their hands. They would throw into the crowd. That's what they do. And they were standing there with grenades. So I went there to watch him. And I said, then you begin to pray. You stop the meeting and you begin to pray. And when you were praying for the crippled, suddenly his crutches flew out, flew away from under his arms. And he was standing on his legs for the first time in his life. Then he, everyone was shocked. He took one step. He took two steps. He began to walk. And after a few steps, his hands went up into the air and he began to shout, Jesus is alive. And he said he came to the front and then he said when he got on the platform, that's when the whole crowd saw who he was. And that's why everybody <laughs> kind of followed him. You know what? Revival broke loose from there. Revival exploded. And churches immediately in the aftermath, just in a couple of months, over 70 churches were planted. And revival came to that place. And amazing things began to happen. So what happened now, I never went back again. I felt like God's grace had lifted from me for that area and I pulled away. Twelve years later, I was in South India. I have a friend who, was at, who had a church planting Bible school. He had 700 students. I was teaching there. And at that time, there was persecution in India. So I told them, I, told, I was telling the students, don't be afraid if the people as devil is bigger than your God, you are in trouble. But if your God is bigger than the devil, you're going to win. Then I told them this story of this man. And when I finished the story, the bell rang, the class was over, I stand outside, I stood outside to get some fresh air, and I saw this young man coming towards me, and he was crying. And he jumped on me, threw himself around my neck, and he just cried on my shoulder. I said, young man, can I do anything to help you? What is it? He said, pastor, I didn't recognize you, but when you told this story, I recognized you. I was a 10-year-old boy sitting on the ground with my mother in the first row. I remember that day. I remember when that man came walking and he was shouting, Jesus is alive. At that moment, he said, I gave my life to Jesus and God called me to the ministry. He says, not only me, but there were, we were 10 of us that I know of. We were all little kids between the ages of 8 and 12. And he says, today we are all in this Bible school, all 10 of us, six guys and four girls. And we, are, we answered the call of God. And they were all in the classroom, but none of us recognized you. But I did the moment you began to tell this story. He said, I'm, now, I'm here to study to be a church planter. So all 10 of us are here. Anyway, so I, that, at that time I thought, you know, we preach the gospel and we missionaries and sometimes it's lonely and you wonder, do people know what we are doing? Do people appreciate what we are doing? And that, at that time I was encouraged. Anyway, 10 more years passed and I'm preaching Mark Brazil's conference in Tulsa and there, uh, uh, no, no, then a few years later I got, I got an email from India uh, from this 
leading pastor in that, in, in, in who had organized this crusade, he said to me, brother, I thought you were dead. You know, Indians will tell you on your face what they think. I thought you were dead, but I'm glad to hear you're alive. He says, yeah, I heard you're living in America. I want you to know. He said, what you did that time, all those years ago, he says, that move of God has still continued for these past 22 or 25 years. The move of God continues. He says, when you came, the percentage of Christians in that region was less than, was about, sorry, it was about one point, a little over one percent. He says now that area is more than 18 percent born again, spirit-filled Christians. He says the move of God continues. People who were saved in those meetings, young people, they're pastors now and they're preaching the gospel praying for the sick and then so I was so encouraged a couple of years later I was preaching a Mark Brzee's conference and and uh, I told this story after service this young man comes to me young Indian guy he says pastor I know I know this this is this happened before I was born but my father was the main pastor there and I was born after you were there and I've always heard of you and I want you to know that everything you said was true. God is continuing to move in Pulbani district in India. That is the power of the gospel. That is the power of that simple story. You can talk about church growth conferences and um, we are going to do this and we are going to do that and you know uh, how we are going to sit down and uh, how do you say brain uh, brainstorming. We are going to brainstorming how we can grow our church and how we can get more people to come to church. But let me tell you, it's the simple gospel of Jesus that changes people's lives. It's the simple gospel. And that's all I did. People ask me, well, what did you do to make that happen? Well, I just did one thing. I preached the gospel. I just preached that simple gospel. I told them the story of Jesus again and again. But the Holy Spirit did the rest. Because when we tell people the story of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will always come in and do the rest. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. God is good, and he can use you. Amen. You just have to be bold and not be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know, many people say, well, I don't like to talk about Jesus. I like to live that lifestyle. You know why you don't like to talk about Jesus? Because you're ashamed of him. You think people would laugh at you if you tell them the story. Christianity is more than your lifestyle. It is that story. That story. Never forget that story. That story of Jesus. Telling people the story of Jesus. How he suffered and died for them. How he bore their sins and diseases upon his own self. How he died. And how he rose up from the dead. That is that story. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads together. Thank you, Father. I just want to make sure I always do this. Maybe everybody here knows Jesus. But if there's anybody here who says, Pastor, I need to get right with God. I need forgiveness of sins. If there's anybody like that, you need to make things right with God. Or you need to get saved. Or you need to. Make things right with God. Need your sins forgiven. Whichever way you put it. If that's you, who you are, let, let me see your hand so I can pray with you if there's anybody like that.